Most of us think that if you develop high blood pressure or hypertension, that you should eat a low salt diet. However, it's interesting that the science is not really all that well defined. Is salt bad for you? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional information online. Thanks for sending me the videos. And this is a video by Jason Fung. Dr. Fung is an internal medicine specialist, a nephrologist, kidney specialist in Toronto, and it has some great books, The Obesity Code, The Diabetes Code, The Cancer Code, has a big following and likes to teach internal medicine and metabolism at his site. Be sure to wait till the end where I give you my final thoughts on what he has to say. Before we dive into today's video, I want to invite you to my free webinar, Beyond Cholesterol, the two biggest risk factors for cardiovascular disease. If you're confused by cholesterol or feeling pressured by your doctor to take cholesterol medication, this webinar is perfect for you. Discover the crucial facts about why cholesterol isn't the primary concern for cardiovascular disease risk, and learn what you should focus on instead to evaluate and lower your risk. You can sign up below. Most of us think that if you develop high blood pressure or hypertension, that you should eat a low salt diet. And this has been the teaching for the last 30, 40 years to virtually everybody, to the general public, to physicians, to dietitians, to everybody. However, it's interesting that the science is not really all that well defined. And several years ago, the Institute of Medicine in the United States, which is responsible for looking at the sum total of these evidence supporting a low salt diet, actually concluded something quite to the contrary. When they looked at all the scientific evidence that was available, the first conclusion they made was that the lack of evidence of benefit and concern for harm suggests that low sodium intake should not be recommended. Yeah, so when I was in training in the 1980s and 90s, internal medicine, uh, we were the ones who focus on and did studies on and, and then family medicine as well would measure the blood pressure, right? And it's pretty amazing that someone figured this out, that if the blood pressure was elevated, you know, extremely high, it might be a cause for a headache, a stroke, heart pain, chest pains, even a heart attack, if the blood pressure is really high, say over 200, 220 milligrams. If the blood pressure is really high, say 200 or 220 millimeters of mercury, it's in millimeters of mercury, or the low number is 120 millimeters of mercury, you might even have a heart attack. So if someone comes to the emergency room, we ask, you know, are you having symptoms? And what, even if the blood pressure is really high, if you are not having those kinds of symptoms, we, we relax a little bit. We get much more urgent uh, to react if you do have those symptoms of threatening a heart attack or a stroke with that high blood pressure. This is a different situation where you might be going to the doctor's office, they measure the blood pressure, and they tell you that it's a little bit high. And so it's a mild blood pressure elevation. And the proper way to really diagnose it, it's important to go over this, is not just one setting. You, you would never diagnose high blood pressure just with one reading. You would say, you know, it's high today. Come back in a few months, not just tomorrow, and, and we'll repeat the blood pressure reading. So you don't want to make the, the, the determination of lifelong treatment for blood pressure based on just one reading. And of course, if it is elevated over several occasions at the doctor's office, the first recommendation is lifestyle change, not medication. Although many doctors will say, well, none of my patients will change their lifestyle, so I'll just put them on medication. Well, we see in our clinic with diet change, reductions in blood pressure. So if someone comes to me with elevated blood pressure and, and another doctor says they need to be on a medicine, I'll say, well, are you going to be losing weight on this kind of lifestyle program? If they say yes, I'll say, well, it's 
likely the blood pressure will come down so we don't even need to institute a new medicine or, or that first medicine. So, but the studies here that are being collected together are for mild hypertension over lots and lots of people. And it really consumed, gosh, a lot of time and effort over the last several decades to talk about blood pressure and the management. And, and it is very high on the list as a risk factor for heart disease. So if you have cardiometabolic issues, you've had a heart attack or a stroke, you want to be measuring the blood pressure, it's almost as important as reversing the diabetes that you have. That should be the number one thing to target. So here we're talking about just does a low sodium, does a low salt diet impact mild hypertension? And the latest recommendations are no. Because what they're saying is that you should not eat a low salt diet, you should eat more salt. For example, in this article in the British Medical Journal, they took 34 different trials that had been published and they included it in their analysis. And what they saw was that on average, when you eat a low salt diet, you can reduce the blood pressure by 5.4 millimeters of mercury. On the top and on the bottom, the diastolic, it goes down by 2.4. And that was their conclusion. They said that there was a significant and important fall in the blood pressure in normal and people with high blood pressure. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? It's not quite that simple because one of the things you have to do when doing these meta-analyses is to look for evidence of publication bias. So a small trial that shows that eating less salt causes lower blood pressure might get published, whereas a small trial that shows the opposite, that eating a low salt diet does not cause any difference in blood pressure, may not be published. Those small trials that didn't show any effect of blood pressure lowering didn't get published. And those trials that did show an effect on blood pressure lowering did get published. And what that does is it causes this systemic bias and causes you to think that there's truly an effect when there actually isn't. And that's a real concern. Well, <laughs> fortunately today, you can measure your blood pressure at home. And I'm a big fan of home monitoring of blood glucoses. If you have prediabetes or, or diabetes, you should be monitoring even with a continuous glucose monitor. There are a lot of people who are biohackers using their, their glucose, their, their money to measure the glucose. I'm not so sure that's necessary, but a lot of people are measuring that. A blood pressure cuff is easy to purchase to get at home. Definitely if you're on blood pressure medicine, I recommend getting a cuff for the home, especially when you're going to change the lifestyle and it, we expect the blood pressure to come down as you change the lifestyle and lose weight. You're going to be monitoring the blood pressure at home to be sure that it doesn't go too low. And I commonly take away medications from people for blood pressure, as well as diabetes, as well as heartburn, as well as all these other things. So here, the I, I didn't quite follow the, the proof of publication bias here. We used to call it file drawer bias, meaning the ones that don't show what you want to see, you just leave in the file drawer and never go through because it didn't meet your expectation. That was done with the low fat diet in one major study where it was just kept actually in, a, in the investigator's basement for years. And when asked, they said, well, the, the study didn't come out the way we wanted to, it to. So that may be what's going on here. But don't trust, you don't need to wait for other studies. You can measure the blood pressure yourself. In 2015, what they found is that the, it completely changes the dynamic. In fact, as you eat more salt, your blood pressure goes down. It doesn't go up. Salt is only one part of the overall diet. You have to remember that ultra processed foods not only contain more salt, but contain all kinds of other things, preservatives and nitrites and sugar. So maybe the salt is only a marker for eating all this highly processed food and is not actually dangerous for itself. Well, and the insulin levels, as they go up, signal to the kidney to hold on to the sodium. So that 
the ultra processed food with carbohydrates is going to raise the insulin level and have you hold on to the extra sodium that's in that food. If you do a low carb keto diet and you notice that you're urinating a lot in the first week, what's happening is that you're letting go of the sodium in water that you were holding on to excessively. So you may actually see that physiology there. Looking at the urine sodium reminded me of a program that was here at, in Durham, North Carolina. In fact, was owned once by Duke called the Duke Rice Diet the rice diet program, then it was all independent on its own. But there it was 800 calories of rice, fruit, and fish to start people out and was ultra low in sodium. And they measured the sodium in the urine at the clinic. And if there was any trace of sodium, they knew people had cheated or they knew people had eaten off the plan and eaten foods with sodium. So you, you can actually measure the urine sodium as a, re a reflection of how much that individual has been eating the salt. Uh, the apocryphal story, I'm not quite sure if it's true, is that there was a comedian who came to town, to Durham, and put salt in the salt in the urine samples outside the clinic doors people would have to take the urine and put it outside the clinic they would check for sodium in it and there was so much salt that it broke the the machine that was measuring the sodium so that was the rice diet which was a version of it ultra low fat high carb yet low calorie and very low salt type of diet it was used for blood pressure management for a long time. And it was one of the root beginnings of using salt restriction for blood pressure. It, that came from, in part, from the rice diet, which was ultra low in sodium and led to low blood pressure as a result in people who had high blood pressure. Here, we're seeing that that being tested in different populations didn't have the same sort of response. But then I'm reminded of one of the first days I was at the, one of the residential weight loss programs here in Durham at Duke. Uh, the nurse asked me to run to the cabinet and get some salt in the form of bullion stat. And I, I one of my first days, I, here's a, a nurse telling me to go get a cube of bullion and mix it up like tea and, and stat and emergency. So I go in, the, the gentleman who's here to lose weight and is on all these blood pressure medicines, it, it doesn't really know where he is and his blood pressure is really low. So he sips on the bullion, which is about a gram, maybe 800 milligrams, a gram of sodium. And within 10 minutes, his blood pressure comes up and he says, you know, where am I? Well, so he had over-medicated over from the blood pressure medicines and we, we didn't take it away from him fast enough before he had a low blood pressure. This is one reason why you need to monitor the blood pressure at home when you're on a lifestyle or diet program because you want to catch it before it becomes that late where he didn't know where he was. His blood pressure was so low. But giving that salt raised the blood pressure enough so that he knew where he was and we were able to instruct him to lower, you know, take away that blood pressure medicine as time went on. Uh, he continued to have the lower blood pressure and got off his medicines. But so there, this is against the, the theme of this video where salt doesn't matter for hypertension, mild hypertension among populations. For an individual, I can give salt and raise the blood pressure a little bit, and that is something I teach my patients, especially if you're on blood pressure medicine and you find yourself with a low blood pressure. Just mix up a cube of bouillon, drink it like tea. You might have one or two of those a day. I also recommend that during the first keto adaptation period because we think it's the fluid shifts that are causing those symptoms during keto adaptation. So that's a little different twist on the idea that salt is fine and it doesn't cause high blood pressure. Well, actually, salt can raise the blood pressure in, uh, in a moment-to-moment -moment situation. So if you're worried about eating salt, you have, to, you have to know that the Institute of Medicine actually does not recommend that you eat a low-salt diet despite 
the supposed effects on its blood pressure. So in summary, internist nephrologist is teaching us about salt and reviewing large population studies that really didn't show much effect of salt restriction. I wish, and I maybe he will in other videos, uh, I wish Dr. Fung would bring up the idea that it may be carbohydrates that are actually causing the essential high blood pressure. I've talked about this with Dr. David Unwin in the UK. He has a paper about this that maybe it's carbohydrate that's actually causing the high blood pressure. Essential hypertension means we don't know what's causing it. Well, we take carbohydrates away and the blood pressure comes down in just about every circumstance. So it actually may be the, the carbohydrates and then the insulin and the sodium retention is the root cause of hypertension, you know, population wide. But short of, you know, making some sort of prediction or a judgment about that, you can measure your blood pressure at home, especially in a therapeutic kind of program. I encourage you to do that. If the high number gets below 100 millimeters of mercury or the low number gets under 60 millimeters of mercury, you can feel weak and dizzy, faint when you stand up. Those are the times when I would recommend reducing medication with your physician's recommendation and involvement, of course. Well, another great teaching video from Dr. Jason Fung. And if you like, please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and look for new content every Wednesday and Friday. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out AdapterLifeAcademy.com.